I'm Scott Allen Miller, and today we may be covering what might be my most requested topic of all time. It's certainly the most request I've ever had for a response to a specific video, or in this case, set of videos. Today we're going to be doing a deep dive into what I think is the important feedback on the Allison's journey story of her husband being in, uh, in jail for 72 days due to a traffic accident that happened in the south of Nicaragua. This has been a very popular video series on uh, YouTube and a lot of people have had questions about it and are looking for a response. And so I've been waiting for that to be finished, waiting for her to wrap up any additional information that she's going to provide. And I'm going to do my best to provide some insight into what happened, what may have happened that wasn't uh, included there. And most importantly, uh, how does this impact you as a potential expat, as someone looking to maybe visit or live in Nicaragua? And are the things that happen to Allison's family things that you need to be concerned about? Could you protect yourself? And more importantly than anything is what should you be doing so that you're not at this risk? So we're gonna dig into all of that right after the bump. Before we dig in, if you're not aware, this is a series of videos that has appeared on YouTube uh, from Allison's journey. Her family has been living in San Juan del Sur, uh, in the south of Nicaragua in the Enclave area for the last three years. And recently, in about four months ago, I believe, uh, there was a traffic accident. Um, her husband was involved in an accident where a local Nicaraguan passed away due to the accident and uh, he was uh, sent to jail, as is common uh, in that situation, uh, while awaiting trial or while awaiting investigation uh, and that ended up taking 72 days they are now back in canada she has released i believe 12 videos that go through 13 parts i know it must be 11 videos that go through 12 parts uh, where she digs into kind of a day by day uh, walk through of the 72 days what happened what they did how it turned out and all that and so uh, that i think is a valuable thing to watch uh, but i do think you should watch it especially if you're here watch this first because if you watch her videos with a Nicaraguan uh, mindset, with a bit of context, I think they're a lot more meaningful. If you watch them without that, it's easy to feel her panic because it's real and, and be, be way more worried and concerned than you should be if you knew what was actually happening or knew how people on the ground were seeing it or should have been thinking about it. And so I think that some context is important uh, before we dig uh, into it. But I do encourage you to go watch those videos after this one because she does have some really good content and I think she does a good job of presenting it. And we are relatively certain that her content is accurate uh, within what incredibly loose ability we have to check that because we do have someone in our community here who actually knows the person who passed away and definitely confirmed that he believed her story was correct which if you watch your stuff and it'll be clear when we talk about this that they were not at fault he was simply involved her husband was simply involved in an accident where someone passed away he was not the cause of that accident the person who died was the cause of that accident that is both her description and what I've heard independently about that. So we believe that to be true. So as a foundation, that's important. But I want to dig into a number of items here because I think there's a lot to learn from this and a lot to understand what happened. Now, first things first, a little bit of context. Remember that we're looking at this at the end of the story. We already know how it turned out. We already know a number of things that happened. So there's a very big risk of us Monday morning quarterbacking, meaning accidentally using or intentionally using information that was not available to the people at the time in order to be like, oh, you did, you did something wrong based on things they didn't know or things that weren't true at the time. Now we know certain things. Back then they didn't. Now we don't know everything they don't know, but we certainly know a lot more now. So that's a risk. What we want to do is a post-mortem and say, what happened? Could you have present, prevented it? What should people do in the future to uh, protect themselves? There, There's useful takeaways, but uh, judging their decisions or actions in the moment is not useful, right? Because beyond, we don't know how many of the things were learned later versus at the time. That's one factor. But also, you have to remember, and this is extremely real, that Allison, who is telling the story uh, and who was dealing with a lot of the decision making. Her husband went to jail and basically had no input, right? Screaming, get me a lawyer at the beginning was about his entire input throughout the process. So this is all being done by Allison and in the beginning, she is doing so under um, confusion and panic 
And the panic is definitely real. Think about the fear and panic you would have. They have small children. They're living in a country that is not their own. They're in an area where they don't have connections. They don't have the, the knowledge of things. There's a bunch of things that are missing uh, that if you were to have the same situation happen in your home country, you'd be like, oh, I know people. Someone will tell me what's going on. I, I understand the process. They didn't have that, right? So there's a whole bunch of panic at the beginning as they just didn't know how bad this could get and they didn't know where to turn. Those things are just, that's going to cause panic. So remember, there's this panic mindset at the beginning. And then that, we believe, right, doctors believe that that quickly triggered uh, her to have a really severe medical reaction that was life-threatening and really severe. And so a ton of their story is driven by, and this is easy to miss when you're looking at the story, uh, is driven by uh, her needs for her health care, right? So a lot of the time she wasn't available. She had to be in the hospital. A lot of things were, were much more stressful, much more difficult than they needed to be because of that. Um, and it caused them, right or wrong, we can't say, but it was certainly a major factor in some of their decision making. And that it's important to understand that if you don't have that medical condition, this right there means this would be a very different scenario for you. So those are important things. Um, as context. So we want to really carefully not be judging anything that was done. We want to provide tools to understand the situation and to prevent my viewers or people you talk to or whatever uh, from having something like this arise because there are ways we believe to prevent this. Now, we only believe, right? No one can say that there was something, maybe this was unpreventable. That is not known, but we would assume so. And most people who I've spoken to about it are have like the exact same takeaways that um, the, the things that would have would have protected them were things that would have needed to have been done long ahead of time, not their actions. Once the events happened, they were stuck on a trajectory that was not very positive. Uh, so let's dig into why this, I don't think this is a risk for my audience. Um, and even if it isn't, what should you be doing in order to protect yourself against the possibility of it? Um, first thing I want to note, uh, for those who are like, oh, this is an unforeseen circumstance. A lot of people, I think, have that reaction. No, go back and watch our videos. We had a lot of discussion and a very specific video on, on two things. One, we have had a number of videos that talk about the increased danger of being an expat in San Juan del Sur. And we have a very specific video on exactly that this can happen if you're in a traffic accident. And it's a major reason why we warn people to be very consciously making a decision whether or not you want to drive in a country like Nicaragua where these kinds of risks exist. And if that is something you're going to do, you accept that this is a risk you're going to have, right? So as the person driving, first of all, her husband accepted that this is a risk he was willing to take in order to be a driver in Nicaragua. I drive in Nicaragua as well. It is a risk that I accept. If I was to be in an accident, I fully expect to have to go to jail. I would also be very unhappy as he was, right? So Yes, that is a risk that we know of. We have published. Everyone talks about. People who live here are very aware of it. And most of the stories, for me, it's all the stories that I've heard about of people who have had non-fault jail time. Now, this is not prison. This is jail time. This is a holding cell at the police station while they figure things out. This is not you've, you've been, you know, charged with anything and you go to prison. That is a completely different thing, right? Also bad, right? But the, a completely different thing. Don't get the wrong impression. This is a holding cell at the police station just so you can't skip out and get away from a responsibility should you be found responsible. I do know people who've been at fault, killed someone, and went to prison. That is different, right? Of course that's going to happen. But this is a system that a lot of people are not aware of or used to if you're visiting. If you live here, Everyone knows this is common knowledge in Nicaragua, but that's why we publish a video that goes into what these risks are so that you're aware that you, if you decide to be driving here, these are risks you will be taking. If you accept that you're going to have those risks, of course, there are very common things that you then do to make sure you're safe, like always having a lawyer at the ready. Of course, you would never drive here unless you had your lawyers lined up and knew all that stuff but you likely wouldn't have a car if you didn't have a lawyer. So that's the first thing is that, um, or, or kind of backing off just a little bit. First thing that was surprising about Allison's story is that they'd lived here for three years. So only months shorter than I've been living here. 
Now, to be fair, I lived here previously in 2015, I have visited in between, and I've been here a little bit longer than they have. But the total amount of time is not that significantly different, and uh, and uh, there's a certain amount of getting to know your community, getting to know your country, getting to know the processes and things that you need to know to be in a place that is expected. And the way that the information was presented, the way that they're surprised about how things happened and worked and their connections and who they had to call, felt like the response of someone who had been living in the country for months, three to maybe six months, not someone who had been here three years, uh, generally someone who's been here for a year is going to have a you know already gone through a number of lawyers and found one that they feel pretty good about they're going to know neighbors and uh, community members and and have resources now i'm not saying that everyone will just magically be connected because you come and live in a place but if you live in a community and you participate in a community that you've moved to intentionally uh you know i know i know a lot of expats and all the expats that i know here in leon all have these resources to go out and, and deal with stuff, right? If something like this happened, they would have so many people to call on. So even if they didn't have a lawyer, they would have someone who had a lawyer and, and people that they trust, not, not the situation that she had. Um, they would have uh, accountants. They would have uh, just, just a knowledge base of people. Um, and it's just normal. And so this is the first surprise. And, and it's, this is very important to understand. This is not wrong. It's not bad. Right, but it is a personal risk, and we made a video. So I'm I'm making a series of videos on expat skills unrelated to this. But in that series, one video that we made for it was talking about the dangers that you incur, and that was inspired by this. So she didn't have. We can't say, well, why didn't you watch a video? Because it happened because the other way around. Um, if you isolate yourself, especially by living in an enclave which they are. San Juan del Sur is an enclave. I know people like to claim it's not because people don't like thinking they're in an enclave. It is, it is what it is, right? And this, and her series of videos is a really good proof of just how much it is. And it's not wrong to be in an enclave. Sometimes it's good to be in an enclave, but it does carry risks. And this is one of them that uh, th they didn't somehow over the course of three years, didn't become knowledgeable about Nicaragua and how things work in a very general sense. And that proved to be very dangerous for them. They didn't have resources to call on. Uh, now, that could have happened if they lived somewhere else, but by being in an enclave, there is so much more opportunity, one, to be isolated and, and just not get to know people, but two, to actually have a framework of con artists around you. And this is what San Juan del Sur has become famous for. I'm not saying that it's not a wonderful place with beautiful views that you couldn't choose to live in and be very successful. I'm saying that there are known risks that we warn people about all the time that both enclave living in general carries risks that you need to mitigate. And San Juan del Sur specifically has its own risks that it has become well known for. And someone asked me recently, uh, could I talk about the in the greater risk uh, of interacting with police in San Juan del Sur before this happened? And uh, we haven't done a video specifically on that, but this her video series really drives home just how much everything went wrong and how much more aggressive I think the police were there than in other places because there is this accepted behavior of wrongdoing in San Juan del Sur that has become so common and so famous. I mean, the country is getting a, a, a reputation because of San Juan del Sur. So, of course, the police are going to struggle to look past that and think, oh, these are not San Juan del Sur residents. In the general sense, they're a special case, right? And of course, there are special cases, lots of them. But when you have a community that's created a bad reputation for itself and you have people who are uh, isolated within that community and are not going out and participating in, in the public space to create an alternative identity for themselves, your risk is that much uh, increased. But so that's the first video is talking about how moving to a new country, you sever your family ties. I realize some people have family in the place they're moving to, but in general, you're severing tr general family ties, the group of friends that you have growing up. Like I grew up in Western New York. I have family, friends, all kinds of resources in Western New York. Plus I have an inherent knowledge of how things work. Even if my family, not a single member was available, not if a single friend was available and something happened to me, I know exactly how to interact with the police. I know exactly how to find a lawyer. I know exactly how processes work and all kinds of things. I know what, what is correct and incorrect and expected and, and not expected, what social norms say I need to do and what would be faux pas. All of that I know because I grew up there. 
And so between having grown up there and just naturally knowing all this stuff, plus the family and friends to call on, I don't need a lawyer. I don't need anything. People would find them for me in minutes. Someone would have that to call on at any time for me. By being in a new country, all of you, at the moment that you move, you're going to sever all those things. Not sever them from where you left. Like if you went back home, of course, they're still there. But in the place you're moving to, things that you've probably grown accustomed to, having this inherent knowledge of the place you live in, having family to call on, having friends to call on, all of that is gone. Now you will make new friends, you may accumulate a group that's like family, and you will get to know what the policies and processes and, and uh, that my business speak comes out, um, and, and the social norms and all that of the place you move to over time. But at the time that you move, you won't have those things. Now, normally we expect people to start accumulating those within the first few months and by six months or so to be pretty functional, that you're, you're at a point where yes, you're relying on people more than you would in the place that you came from, but you're growing that knowledge and, and growing your, your base and people understand that you need help and they're there to help you. So in many ways, I would say here, after having been here for a few years, we have more support network here than we do anywhere back home. Less knowledge, but pretty close, but definitely a larger support network. So that's the first thing that got them is they didn't do those things. Somehow they moved in, stayed in an enclave and lacked all of that connections and knowledge that you normally accumulate and should be seeking to accumulate. So that's our first warning. Our second one is that they did not have a lawyer. We're going to dig into this, but we're going to have a video coming out as part of the expat skill series that just talks about why you always need to have a lawyer when you're in a new country. You also need one in your old country. And it's amazing how many people came out and said, um, I don't have one in my country. And I'm like, that's really something you should consider dealing with. I would be afraid to live in the US without a lawyer, not because it's the US, because it's just life and you should have a lawyer. Um, it would, there, it's not, you know, the US might be a little bit more needy of lawyers in most places, but when you move to a new country, it doesn't matter what country you move to, you're going to need lawyers more. Now, Nicaragua is a place where lawyers are very cheap and everybody tends to rely on them much more heavily. It's not a litigious society. It is a society that utilizes lawyers for a lot of day-to-day -day things. And so quite often, even if you're just renting an apartment, you would use a lawyer. In the United States, quite often you would not. You just have a standard rental agreement. Lots of people do it. Here, nearly everything's a one-off, so you always want your lawyers looking over your paperwork. And we don't have escrow accounts, so you often have lawyers dealing with financial transfers to make sure that you can work safely without an escrow account. Not that they absolutely don't exist, but from a practical standpoint, they don't exist. And uh, legal filings here are extremely official. They have to be on official paper. They have to be filed with the government in a specific way. It's not like in the U.S. where you're like, you can be at the bar, grab a napkin, write a contract, have your buddy sign it, you sign it. The bartender, you know, uh, uh, notarizes it, not really, but, you know, um, witnesses it and good to go. You got a pretty solid contract there. Here, that would be BS, right? No one, the, the government would be like, that's a napkin. You were drunk and you didn't file that. Here for a contract to be really solid, it has to be done very officially, signed very officially, witnessed very officially, and filed filed very officially. And those are a lot of things that just work better with a lawyer. So people use lawyers for things. And you can argue either direction being good or bad or whatever. That's not really relevant. The point is, if you're here, every little thing requires a lawyer, but nearly nothing requires anyone else. So it's a little bit different that nearly all the different agents that you use for different things in the United States get rolled into lawyers here. But lawyers are cheap here as opposed to super expensive in the US. So it really does work out pretty well. The one thing that isn't part of that is notaries, but often lawyers are notaries anyway. So notaries are also a bit more important here than other places. So that skill will be coming out. But that brings us to some points about Allison's story. So after the accident took place, they won didn't know to go out and get a lawyer immediately. Her husband yelled to get a lawyer, but Allison was unsure if that was good advice. And she waited on that a little bit. Understandably, panic and so forth, we're not second guessing her. It's just a fact that she brought up that she didn't react quite as quickly as she probably should have. If we could go back and Monday morning quarterback, the first thing we would say to her is, yes, get a lawyer as fast as you can. Don't wait until the next day. Make sure you get it the first day. But what's really surprising here is that having lived in Nicaragua for three years, having a car and are driving, and it turns out later in the story, have purchased a house. This family, after three years, did not have a lawyer. 
I'm not even sure how this is possible. I mean, I know how you could contrive this to happen, but in practical terms, I'm not sure how you could arrive at a scenario where you've done all these things and don't have a lawyer. They also had their residency, which also normally requires a lawyer. It doesn't require a lawyer, but it's expected that you will use a lawyer. So they have one, three years in country. That's a long time. You expect anyone here for over six months uh, to start at least be talking to lawyers. They have a house here. You really are supposed to have a lawyer to do that. The expectation, it is the only role that you're expected to have working with you when getting a house is a lawyer. You do, you have no reason to use a real estate agent. You're allowed to, but you're certainly not expected to. We have tons of videos that explain why that doesn't make any sense and why in that the more you have a real estate agent, the more you need a lawyer that why you would never consider it without a lawyer, stuff like that. We, we have a lot of training on that that goes way back to before they bought their house. Um, we have, uh, plus that's just, just basic knowledge, right? And then that's not Nicaragua knowledge, that's adulting knowledge, right? It doesn't matter if it's the US, it doesn't matter if it's Canada, Europe, Latin America, you always have a lawyer for that kind of transaction. Sometimes you have a real estate agent, but you never have a non-lawyer, right? You never have a lack of lawyer when buying a house. So that's that's the first thing. How did they get residency without a lawyer, a house without a lawyer, a car without a lawyer? These are things that one, all only makes sense to do with a lawyer. They're all legally allowed to be done without one, but that would be absolutely crazy. So you always have a lawyer for any of those actions along with many others. And more, not more importantly, but also quite important, these all are non-life destructive moments of activity that give you a chance to seek out and evaluate your relationship with a lawyer under non-stressful, non-emergency situations because all people that are adults, especially adults who have children, and really, really, really especially anyone who is living in a new jurisdiction, which could be a state, province, or country, needs to have a trusted lawyer because there are things you need to be able to ask, things you need to have verified, and you always need a lawyer on call. I don't care who you are, what you're doing. It doesn't require you to have done something. It requires you to have been blamed for something, someone to come after you, someone try to trick you. You need to have the availability of a lawyer. It is part of being a safe adult. It is unfortunate that the world works this way, that, that governments require lawyers to do things that seemingly should just be automatic and handled by the universe. I agree, but it is not how the world works anywhere that I know, certainly nowhere in Europe, Latin America, North America, anything like that. You need a lawyer. And so these are opportunities to have evaluated multiple lawyers potentially and have honed in on ones that you felt confident were at least legitimate lawyers, if not really good ones, if not ones that you would trust your life with, which is really, really important because this is, there's no person in your personal ecosystem that is going to be more important to you when you live abroad. It is how you save money, it is how you protect yourself, and it is how you deal with disaster. So uh, it, that's something that's really amazing here is that they didn't seek out having a lawyer and didn't use or didn't have lawyers from many different processes. And these are just ones we know about. We don't know if they had a business. We don't know if they did anything else. What were they doing that they had all these lawyer trigger moments and didn't have a lawyer at all? So they were really lost. They were acting as if they had only been here, again, less than six months, non-residents, not investing anything, not having a house. Um, you know, people who are on vacation for the weekend that's what it felt like, but they've been living here for three years. That's really surprising. So these points are important at this point because a lot of people who are asking me about these videos are asking, I'm scared, should this make me worried about coming to Nicaragua? And no, because you don't have her health risk, you will get to know your community. No one who's watching my channel, even those of you who are interested in enclave living in, in San Juan del Sur, which is a percentage, maybe 10, 15% of my audience, I'm really generalizing, but I think that's about right from, from I do talk to a lot of you, uh, feel that that is what they're really interested in, whether it's Grand Pacifica or something down south, right? That that type of somewhat separate living is of interest to you. Maybe not because it's separate, just because of the other factors that it provides. Oh, a little completely managed community on the waterfront where I don't have to worry about a bunch of things. Totally get it, makes sense, right? But anyone who's watching my channel has a couple of things. One, you have 
just a general sense of Nicaraguan community. It's hard to imagine, and I've met a lot of you, any one of my viewers coming and being intentionally so disconnected as Allison and her family. Again, this is nothing that they did wrong at all. They seem like very nice people who seem very innocent people who got caught in something that was basically over their head in a scenario they had not prepared for, right? So, right, we don't want to in any way present this as they did something wrong. It's simply that they did something I don't anticipate any of you would do. So all of you would, I think, be more integrated into your community. Maybe not like I am, which is very strong, but more. You would have some amount of neighbors to call on, people that you had gotten to know over a period of three years. You'd have friends and neighbors and, and people, uh, especially as a foreigner living in the country, you tend to connect with people in a very different way and have a certain number of resources. There will always be an exception, but I think it's a, it's a pretty unlikely uh, uh, exception. Second, every one of you has a resource that you're aware of. Now, Allison could have done this too, but was not aware, I assume, uh, of this channel. Any one of you could, in an emergency, write to me, and yes, I'm bad about getting back to people within a few hours. That, that is something I struggle with, and I do not have an SLA on my response on the channel, but you can reach out and me or someone else in the community, if you post on one of the shows, people will see it, even if it's not me. And if it's an actual emergency, someone will try to reach out to me, right? It could be, you know, different people talking to each other, trying to find someone. But if you can track down someone like, like uh, Buddhist or uh, Jillian or Janet or my wife or Marcella, like somebody will see a comment and pick up a phone and call me and be like, there's someone with an emergency, they need a contact, they need to know what to do. This is, this is a real emergency, right? Now, if it's like, I can't find a hotel room tonight, well, you know, we'd like to help, but we're not gonna, you know, our entire ecosystem is not gonna drop everything it's doing to try to track someone down to help. But in something like this, certainly if someone in our community was like, I'm headed to jail, right? It would be your spouse in this case, like they won't let you do it. My spouse has been in an accident. We're visiting Nicaragua. We've only been living here for four months. We have no idea what to do. Please help. This is an emergency and post that or send it to me or, you know, do everything, send it to my email, send it to like, hopefully some way I'll see it fast, right? We can give you information way more than Allison had just like that, right? And we can connect you with resources just like that who would be able to do a lot of help. So that is, that is like right there, the behavior of people who watch this show, the nature of watching this show means you're taking more of an interest in the country than they had, right? They had an interest in the weather and the climate and the food and, and you know, lived in an enclave and that was it. But if you're watching the show, you have this greater interest. So your level of protection from those two factors alone are hard to truly uh, uh, quantify. And then of course, you're essentially not gonna have her medical risks, right? I mean, maybe you do, but you would be aware of that. And, and if you don't have that medical risk, then you know you're not carrying that medical risk. So those are things that, that right there you can say, oh, okay, yeah, I don't have to worry about this because I'm not gonna act that way. I do have these resources and I don't have this medical condition. So that is the first pieces. Then the danger of San Juan del Sur kicked in. Her neighbors started taking advantage of her, started pressuring her, and got her lawyers who, as far as we know, and she has not refuted this, she did hint that she had some more information, but there's a ton, and this is this is tough, right? She doesn't feel comfortable. Um, I presume because she may expose someone who tried to help her here or get someone in trouble who was trying to you know, do something innocently. And uh, so she, there's things that she's not sharing. That makes it a little bit difficult to truly understand what's going on. Um, and she hinted that there's some stuff she might wanna share, but only if she's comfortable. And it's been weeks since she finished the series. So I'm guessing she doesn't feel comfortable. And she seems to have pretty strongly hinted at that she fears for her family's safety in Canada, which I've heard from a lot of Canadians that they're living in a lot of fear in Canada. So apparently there's something much deeper on the Canadian side, because they've been living in Canada for a while now going on. So we just have have to understand that that she feels that her family in Canada is in danger. Um, they've left the safety of Nicaragua, I guess, and now they're worried about what could happen to them. That seems to be um, a, a foundational bit there. 
So there's a lot not being shared on that end. So I don't know what that could possibly be, um, but I'm not Canadian, so I don't uh, I don't really have a good understanding of what all Canadians fear uh, as far as reprisals from their government. Um, but those things are real, obviously. And I do have community members who have said that their willingness to look at Nicaragua has triggered uh, some government reprisals um, in Canada, and it's one of the reasons that they want to get out. So that is corroborated from other Canadians. I have no reason to doubt it, right? Everything we're hearing from Canada seems to, to line up that the level of fear has increased a lot. It's surprising to us from the United States, right, to hear that, but it seems to be a common threat. So I can only surmise that that is uh, uh, reasonably true. Anyway, so there's a lot that we don't know. But so what we got from the story is that the first lawyers that were given to her first had absolutely no behavior as if they were real lawyers. Two, they didn't come very like well understood. It seemed the this may just be her storytelling, but it seemed like they got a guy who wasn't a real lawyer. Then he got some other people who claimed to be lawyers. They claimed to be doing a bunch of stuff, but no one ever knew for sure. And when she questioned whether or not they were real lawyers, a whole bunch of people in her community called and pressured her to try to basically browbeat her into using those lawyers. That was super fishy, and I think we all agree from the story that there's basically no chance that they were real lawyers. She has hinted that there's more to the story, but at the moment we kind of have to work from she was scammed by her entire community. Had her whole community not come together and and vouched for these these lawyers, um, I don't think she would have she would have bought into this. Uh, but but she also didn't knew, know the process of finding a lawyer. Right, they were looking for someone local, and one of the first rules here is that you don't look for local resources in San Juan del Sur. We have to. This is a repeating pattern. It doesn't take much of being in Nicaragua weeks before you learn the you are in great danger if you hire resources out of San Juan del Sur. It is where everyone looking to take advantage of you bases out of because that is where all the money is to be made is uh, from doing that. And so if someone's going to take advantage of you, that is almost not guaranteed, certainly where they will be. That does not mean that there aren't great, honest people in San Juan del Sur. It means that if you are looking for a resource, you are putting yourself at great risk if you select them specifically from a place whose economy depends on taking advantage of you. That is an incredibly foolish way to go, especially when having your lawyer be local in San Juan del Sur really has no advantages, especially when all the court stuff doesn't happen in San Juan del Sur anyway. So that's really like a weird, like it wasn't even local to where the case was. It was just local to where they were talking. Like it, it's just a whole process that's very bad. Working in business as a business consultant, one of the things that we constantly talk about as a basic adulting fail that we see, and I call this adulting fail, meaning any person who got anywhere close to high school should be aware of these things. It should not require business training, business knowledge, business experience, or anything like that. But as a business consultant, this is one of those basic human mental failures that we see constantly make it into the workplace and where people who are senior managers or even owners and investors and in companies make this exact mistake is they take a skill set, which could be being a lawyer, being a graphic designer, being an IT professional, um, basically anything that doesn't require physical labor. Now, of course, doctors are generally need to be physical. So, so anyone working with medical has a tendency to just accumulate this idea of locality. But for everything else, adding the location into the skill set for someone like, oh, I'm evaluating only lawyers and IT professionals and graphic designers who live in my village. Well, that's foolish, right? Why would you care about anything other than how well they can do the job? What does, how does living in the village make them in any way beneficial to you? It doesn't. It means you're prioritizing something that doesn't include how good of a job they're going to do for you. And not only does that mean that you're picking someone who basically by definition, it's not 100% guaranteed, but it is effectively guaranteed, isn't a great choice. They may be an acceptable choice, but you're not evaluating them on that. You're only evaluating them within a subset of people not selected by quality or capability. But it also means that they are aware that you didn't select them based on how good of a job that they do. So they're not going to be evaluated based on being the best. They may be evaluated on trying to do the job, but maybe not, right? You are prioritizing things that isn't their job in selecting them. So why would they not take advantage of you? You're clearly announcing that you're open to that. So that is an important thing that people don't realize when you're selecting something based on its locality, when locality doesn't matter, that you are really creating a scenario to be taken advantage of. 
And it's known in some circles as the church problem, and the, not because churches are specifically a problem, but because studies have been done on when people just hire work, like a roofer or plumber. Oh, I go to church with them, so I'm going to hire them. They know that they've been hired based on their membership in a social group and that you are willing to pay more than market rate and accept less than standard work and possibly open to being really taken advantage of. That's pushing it. But the first two things are basically just proven. Like there's no way to argue that those aren't true. You selected them because they were a member of your social group and you wanted to prioritize your social group above the quality of the job being done. So that's why you looked there first. Instead of looking for the best, you looked for the part of your, your inner circle. And why would they not take advantage of you? They're so incentivized to do so that it ends up being about the least reliable process, or if you want to reverse it, it's the most reliable way to be taken advantage of. Someone who doesn't have that built in, I'm a member of your social group, you can't get mad at me, you can't expose me, you have to look the other way, you have to pay a little bit extra for the, for the you know, extra benefit I'm providing. W without that, other people are pushed. Oh, I'm being chosen based on my quality. I'm being reviewed based on my actual quality. So I need to actually provide quality. So it goes both ways. So it's a very strong thing. So in this case, she was looking for not just local, which is already bad, but looking for local in a place where people go and move in specifically from all over the country who want to take advantage of foreigners because there's a lot of money in it. So that was a terrible process that again, goes back to the not having the experience or knowledge level of, of just living in Nicaragua casually for a short period of time. Now, over time, they found another lawyer, and that lawyer seemed to help quite a bit more. However, I want to point out that throughout the process, this lawyer didn't act like I would expect a Nicaraguan lawyer to act. Now, I understand that Allison would have no idea how a Nicaraguan lawyer should act because she'd not been dealing with one. So once we get past the problems we've already mentioned, this is kind of hard for her to have picked up on. But if from her own description, it sounds like I would have guessed this wasn't an actual lawyer or one that wasn't actually working for her. Of course, when we say not an actual lawyer, in some cases they are barred lawyers uh, who are simply just not doing their job correctly, but it could in many cases be someone who's just posing as a lawyer. She never mentioned asking for credentials or anything. We assume she did, but we have no knowledge, right? So it's easy. And I know people in San Juan del Sur who've had people do this kind of work for them, and it turned out not to be a lawyer, and no one ever asked for credentials. And they're just someone who does legal work, not an actual lawyer, and that put them in a lot of risk. A lawyer taking advantage of you also puts you in a lot of risk, of course, but you want to get through some of these steps and at least do your due diligence when possible. Uh, but so by the end of the story, we're never actually confident if she ever had a real lawyer. What it sounds like, and I'm jumping to the end here, but it sounds like there was uh, someone she met who actually did have a lawyer, a real one, and it doesn't necessarily mean a great one. We'll assume they were good because of the actions they took and that they're willing to jump in and help, but we don't actually know. This could have been just a minimally viable lawyer who was an actual lawyer jumped in, got her husband released, right? So at the end, the only thing that seems to have happened is the moment that a lawyer was involved. He was only in jail a couple of days. That will come to, right? I just want to point out that it looks like from her description, if we were to say this to a group of people, a group of expats, and of course, groups of expats have discussed this as have Nicaraguans, Everyone has agreed that it doesn't sound like she ever engaged an actual lawyer. She tried to. That is not her fault. Just it never seems like the people who were engaged were true lawyers. They didn't act like it. They didn't behave like she was their client. They didn't do the things that, like any lawyer would have been expected to have gotten them out without a problem. So it feels like something more was wrong. Can't know that for sure. But that's our guess is that through the entire process, she never had a lawyer until someone else's lawyer just got him out and showed how easy the process actually was. So the first thing that happened once the accident happened, right, which should have been instantly, right, if you were if you're doing this perfectly, which of course she couldn't, you would have a lawyer on speed dial. Really, her husband should have called the lawyer prior to calling his wife, right? First call, first text on WhatsApp, here's my location in an accident, please be here before the police leave, right? I've had situations where just, you know, I was not involved, but a car had an accident nearby to where I was. I ran out to help direct traffic. First thing I do, in that case, I did let my wife know because she was within earshot, but I immediately texted our lawyer just to let her know where I was and what I was doing. 
unnecessary, but she showed up with people to help with out with the situation within minutes, right? But it shows even if I'm not involved in an accident and I'm not in danger, having my lawyer available is a pretty handy thing. Now, like I said, your lawyer shouldn't be chosen because they're local. Mine happens to be local and wasn't local when they became my lawyer. They became local after I moved to be local to them, not for the purpose of being local to them. It was coincidental. The point being, um, that your lawyer should be on speed dial, or this is Nicaragua, so we mean in your WhatsApp contact list, and you should be able to reach them very quickly. And really, I have three lawyers here that I completely trust and would be able to reach within minutes if I had an emergency. Any one of them could respond um, and help me out. And in a case like this, you would want your lawyer there at the accident scene, if at all possible, or for them to send a representative, or if you need to, hand the phone to the police and be like, here's my lawyer, here's their contact. This way, everyone knows what's going on. They can explain to your lawyer, especially if you don't speak fluent Spanish, this is super important. They can explain things to your lawyer, your lawyer can figure out what needs to be done. They can talk to your spouse, they can talk to your family, they can talk to a local resource, they can call the police station, they can do all these things on your behalf because they're your lawyer, they're identified as your lawyer and they have the contact and information. So that's, that's the proper process, right? So have that at the ready. We'll talk about that in the lawyer video, but definitely that is the smart thing to do. Then yes, call your spouse, call all those people, get that, get that handled. In my case, I have a group with both. I would tell both at the same time. Uh, then the next morning, right? Cause this happened at night. The next morning there's actions that should have been taken. Now the lawyer didn't do what they're supposed to do. So this was not really Allison's fault. There's really no realistic way. Allison would have known what to do here, even if she had been here for a long time, unless she knew people like now a whole bunch of people know things because of Allison's story that you expect your lawyer to have told you right away, but you wouldn't have known without your lawyer because she didn't ha end up having a lawyer. She didn't follow the, the legally required processes that were supposed to happen right away. So this is another thing that happened, right? Is that they didn't go and deal with the family in a timely manner as was required under the law for the thing they wanted to have happen. It is not a legal requirement. This is just to be clear. This is an optional way for all the parties involved to decline a legal procedure. So at this point where we're talking about negotiating with the family, her husband is being held in jail. He is not being charged. They are still investigating the accident. And while they're investigating the accident, she and her husband as his representative uh, and potentially their lawyer and the family of the deceased are able to get together. And, and at some point the person passed away, right? He didn't die at the scene, uh, but he was gravely injured obviously, but very quickly he passed away. They were supposed to go out and, and negotiate and come up with what needed to happen. And at that point, they didn't have proof of who was at fault. But they, they were pretty clear that it was not her husband. But even so in these cases, especially as an expat, you expect to do a little to help out the family. Now, traditionally, what I'm told is in scenarios like this, where you didn't grievously kill someone, they killed themselves and you were involved in the accident in which they were killed. Yes, if you really want to push the point, you can take them to court and you can probably win. But uh, and, and that is a thing that a lot of people like to say wouldn't happen, but it really would in most cases uh, because he was not at fault. They really did have the upper hand legally here. Um, you can negotiate and generally for $2,500 or less. And the reason that it's $2,500, I haven't had this explained to me, but it makes sense, is that that is basically one year's salary for someone. So if a family has lost an income provider, uh, that is a year of that person's income provided to them to help them uh, rebuild their lives or whatever. And, you know, in this case, this is a very poor family who lost someone who is at least partially a provider for the family, probably not very much, but a little bit. And they have grieving, they have funeral expenses, they have, there's a lot of things. And was it her husband's fault? Does he owe them that money in an ethical way? No, but a person died, he was involved, it was, is within reason for them to help them out because this is just a situation where um, it, it's so, uneven how, how the situation is that uh, that would have uh, been a reasonable thing. Could you have gotten out of it? Are you absolutely required to pay that? No, absolutely not. Yes, you, you, it's a gift kind of thing in this scenario where you're like, you know what? I don't want to deal with this anymore. I am willing to pay to not go through the, the process. I don't want you guys to go through extra pain. I want to help out with this, you know, terrible event that happened to your family. It's not their fault, right? It's, it's a family member of theirs fault in this case, but 
right? It, it, it's a it's a goodwill gesture in a way. So that would have been an option. And so you're given this little period of time during the discovery phase in order to do that and be like, let's not use the, the country's resources on this case. Everyone's going to come to an agreement and we'll be okay. So that didn't happen. They kind of tried. They didn't know how it was supposed to work. Allison's lawyers appeared, appeared to have completely uh, tried to scam her. We believe by the end of the story, again, she didn't re provide any additional details. So by the end of the story, it is believed to have been a scam. They also tried pulling the, and this is a huge red flag that alone should have told them everything, that they claimed that this was the family of the president of the country. That's not reasonable, right? The president's family was on an unpowered motorcycle with the lights off, drunk, going down a hill in San Juan del Sur in the middle of the night, and you just happened to hit this expat and Nobody knows who this person is, but one lawyer is like, oh, but he's so-and-so super famous that no one can identify. That alone was him telling them he's not a real lawyer and the whole thing's a scam. That should have been right there, walk away, get another lawyer. Again, I know panic is going on, so there's every reason for her to be like, this is just more panic, more fear. Oh my gosh, this is so terrible. And she wasn't buying it, but she couldn't quite bring herself, I think, to play the I don't believe you card calling your bluff. Um, but that that is kind of where it should have gone at that point. It's just so unrealistic. I'm looking at my notes is why I look down from time to time. So that is um, this really rough point. So they, they miss this negotiation phase that is an option. Now, an important thing to note here, because a lot of people have come down in the notes in her threads and she hasn't disputed them, which is definitely bad behavior, that this is being used as a way to claim that, oh, this is only happening because of third world judicial systems. But very clearly she described in the videos that the judicial system was never used. The judicial system was at their discretion. Naturally, it would kick in after a few days, um, but it didn't because they didn't do the negotiations, but then both parties requested of the court a stay of judicial process so that they could attempt the negotiation. And since the court system was overwhelmed and, and didn't have spare resources, um, we'll talk about that, um, they granted them that. But that was essentially a request for her husband to stay in jail while they tried to work this out with the family. So the judicial system didn't kick in. This was optional. Now, a lot of this is happening. I want to be, I want to reiterate this a bit because it's really important. Because Allison was so sick, they were terrified of the judicial process. They didn't know how it would work. They didn't trust their lawyers. They'd never done it before. With her health condition, she didn't know if she could be there. It was, well, she may have to leave the country at a moment's notice. That was a real, real threat from her medical conditions. Uh, because she has a, what we call a North American condition is a condition caused by North American diets that doesn't exist in much of the rest of the world. And so because of that, Nicaragua just doesn't have a really good, uh, treatment programs for that. They have acute treatment, but not ongoing treatment. And so she needed to get somewhere where they could do that. And only the U.S. and Canada have those diseases, uh, in any real quantity. So they're the only places have treatment for it. So because it was a very specific North American disease, that was affecting her. So because of that, they leaned heavily on a trying to avoid the judicial system. They kept being hopeful that he was going to be let out and it would all be over. Uh, but that, that didn't happen. But at any moment, they could have chosen the judicial path and gone through litigation. And with that, they almost certainly would have won. We don't know how long it would have taken. People were threatening them that it would take a really long time. They were threatening them that they might lose. But the reality is it probably would have been quick. It probably would have won. And we don't know how strong the probability is, but it's, it was quite good. If it was me, I'd have been like, I'll see you in court, right? Now we also, this was never really pointed out in the videos, but it is important at no point that I am aware of in the videos, did the people claiming to be the family of the deceased ever prove they were the family of the deceased? I don't know that that was ever actually reached as a conclusion. It was suggested, people were pretty certain, but there kept being from time to time, Allison would mention that they never provided this proof. That's significant. At no point was she actually able to be, she may have felt this way, I don't know, but at no point could she actually have been truly confident that the people they were negotiating were actually the people that they needed to negotiate with. So that's an additional problem. At the end of the day, I don't know that anyone is actually sure that the people who were paid was the family or just people posing as the family to get money. 
Another thing that happened, and this goes back to the dangers of the Enclave, is that at some point they had negotiated, everything had been worked out, and then suddenly the family asked for a ridiculously larger amount of money, an amount of money that makes absolutely no sense and no court would accept because it's absurd. But they're basically being extorted due to her medical conditions and her just general sense of panic. And it turns out that it was people in the Enclave, San Juan del Sur residents, were making claims about her, about how much money they had access to, and telling the family that they could ask for a lot more money because for whatever reason, I don't know if they were getting a cut of it. Uh, sometimes Nicaraguans, um, even expats, have a really poor understanding of just how wealthy people may be. Um, but they may have been banking on things like, we know they own a house here and they could sell that house, right? They live in San Juan del Sur, so they're definitely not being cost conscious, right? For those of us who look, live in Nicaragua, yes, a lot of us could live in San Juan del Sur, but lots of us don't because it's very expensive compared to the rest of the country. So we do have a natural looking on anyone who lives in San Juan del Sur as being willing to spend money a lot more freely than the rest of the people. So it's easy to imagine groups of, of neighbors wanting to make some money. And the reality is many people gravitate to San Juan del Sur who are pushing destitution because it's a place where they feel they can make money by taking advantage of other new expats, hence the term the expat pyramid, um, the, the pyramid scam uh, of the expats there, where the older expats take advantage of the newer ones. So we see this playing out here. So there's actually, while we perceive people in San Juan del Sur as people who are less spendthrifty than the rest of us, um, the reality is, is that many of the poorest those who have the most difficulty finding uh, ongoing revenue sources or don't have significant or significant enough retirement funds tend to gravitate there uh, because they're, they're hoping that somehow by being there, they're going to find a way to, to increase their revenue stream off of the local expats who are coming in. So that is easily what we're seeing happen there. And this just rolls into that bigger picture of when you live in an enclave environment and you're not as well connected to your community, you have greater risks. And in this case, her neighbors who knew her a little, not people she really knew, I don't think, but people who knew her a little, knew she owned a house, knew she owned a car, knew she lived in an enclave, knew she was in a ritzy area where people were throwing money about a little bit or often bragging about it, even if they're not really able to do it. And for whatever reason, we're, we're definitely guessing, but they decided to uh, work with the family, whether it's the real family or not, to attempt to extort them for an absurd amount of money. So while uh, we can guess that a reasonable amount of money was about $2,500, they were likely trying to scam them for something like twenty-five dollars or $50,000, which if you own a house in San Juan del Sur, you know, part of the problem is every real estate agent claims that every house down there is worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so by owning a house there, if you look on real estate sites, if you're a Nicaraguan, you say, yeah, a house in Nicaragua might be sixteen to $25,000. If you ask for 25,000, someone would be on the street. They couldn't possibly just sell the house, get that money and give it to you. Um, but if someone owns a house and every real estate agent in town is advertising that that house is worth half a million, million dollars. And even if it's not, maybe many of them are worth 60, $70,000. But if they're, do you see that advertising? At some point, the Nicaraguans are going to fall for it too. And a lot of the San Juan del Sur residents have fallen for those things and truly think that some of their houses are worth those kinds of numbers when the house next door can't sell for 150000 So it, there's a lot of just opportunity. And I realize that some of these things could happen anywhere. But being in the enclave, there's just that much more risk of those things happening. And we see that play out. So all the warnings that we have had previously, they really come to fruition here. And it's all very unfortunate, right? None of this is her fault. None of this is because they did something wrong. It's just they, they chose an incredibly risky path uh, to being an expat. And that is something that uh, it turned out that just a perfect storm of bad scenarios came together uh, for them through that. Now, another thing that's really important here, and I kind of touched on this, but I have it as a specific note, and I want to highlight this, is that because of her medical condition, and to some degree because of the stress, but the stress caused the medical condition to flare up. The flare up is the real cause here, I believe. They were in a position where they knew they were in the right. They knew they were being extorted. They knew that he was in jail way too long. They knew that he didn't kill the guy, that he was, you know, maybe could have been a little bit more cautious on, her, on his turn. But from, the, from everything we heard, you know, speeding, lights off, had some drinks in him. We're not going to say drunk. We don't know. But he had been drinking. 
and he killed himself, basically. That would, if you were anywhere else, that's how we would take it. Nicaragua would too. They knew that if they went to court, the chances they were going to lose was low, very low. So, but there's always that fear, especially in another country where there's so many people who are like, oh, you know, everyone from Canada is telling them, oh, it's not a, you know, not a real legal system. It's not going to treat you well, right? And so there's a lot of fear because everybody is trying to trick you. There's so many people trying to take advantage of you. And so it's hard to put yourself in her shoes because of the panic, because of the medical conditions and the unbelievable, overwhelming voices giving her misinformation. Both people who are supposed to be advising her, the fake lawyers or the not very good lawyers, the neighbors, the enclave dwellers, but also all of her family and friends from outside the country, random resources, all these people reaching out, trying to take advantage of the situation, whether just to, you know, make them panic, whether to make the country look bad, whether to, you know, whatever, but, but personal agendas. Because of all these things, they felt, and possibly rightly so, we're not second guessing her, that she could not threaten, I'll see you in court, right? They couldn't opt into the legal procedures. They felt as though, and maybe she was right, that they had to negotiate at any cost, and it was willing, it was worth any loss to do that because the risks of the court felt like maybe not that they would lose, maybe that wasn't the fear, but that it would drag on for too long. Because one of the things, so that's the first thing, they felt that they were not in a position to be able to threaten to go to court. And you need that as a safety precaution, right? You're in the right, you didn't do something wrong, I'll see you in court. I'm, I'm you know, I'm lawyering up and that's where we're going, right? And, and then they may have just buckled. Okay, we're gonna negotiate right now and then you, I don't want to negotiate now, or I do want to negotiate now, I'll give you $500, right? And they say, I'm not going to take that. You say, I'll give you $400, right? You're in that position to do that because you can go to court, but they weren't in that position. So the one true leverage, the piece of leverage that they had, they couldn't use. That's huge, right? So I want to point that out, even though we, we've mentioned it, uh, I want to make sure that it is uh, its own thing designated. So uh, because of that, the legal procedures never kicked in. So the judicial processes, everybody who mentions judicial process failed them is, is falsifying that information. Either they didn't watch the video or they're, they're just lying because it's super obvious from what Allison said that that, that is what happened, that they, she was completely clear that they never uh, let that kick in. Um, now, part of that, I have, this, I have a lot of notes here, is that they were told that there were no judges. Now, it's also confusing in the video. So they live in San Juan del Sur, and she keeps talking about the town over or the, the town next door or whatever. And what she means is the, the regional capital of Rivas, which is actually quite some ways away. Not ridiculously far away, but you would never call it the town next door. It is not that by any stretch. There's maybe 20 towns in between. It's a real distance away. Um, it's a real city. And so she keeps mentioning it like it's another town. Like, But San Juan del Sur is the largest thing in its region. So that sounds really weird when she's saying, oh, but they, they took them to this other town and they have some resources in this other town. And you're like, what? Later, she lets it slip that it's actually Riva she's talking about and not the town next door or the town next door to that or the town next door to that. But the re she should have just called it the regional capital or said Riva. So there's no reason to hide. We all know the, there's only one town that any of these things could happen in. And as soon as the accident happened, everyone should have known it was going to take place in Riva anyway, because that's how these things work. But so Riva, which is between 30 and 45 minutes away, is the regional capital. It's a large city. It is the only real city in the entire departamento of Riva. And that's where a lot of things were happening. Now, are there lawyers in San... Uh, I'm sorry, yes, there are. Are there judges in San Juan del Sur? Easily, no, because it's a little village. I wouldn't expect there to be one. That is a surprising expectation at the beginning. Not unreasonable. Oh, is there a judge here? No. Oh, okay, I didn't think so, but it was possible. Yeah, sure. Do they go on a circuit and stop by sometimes? Easily, but probably not, because it's so easy to go to Rivas, and it's a big city. So... The thing that she was told is that there were no judges and they could not get one and so that he could be in jail for, you know, years because there's no judges. Well, that's simply not true. And it should be really obvious that it's not true. Of course there are judges. There's no possible way for there to be any functional system of any sort if you have no judges. Is there a shortage of judges? Yes. 
All of Nicaragua is short on judges. They would like to have more. It would make the systems move faster. People would get less burnout and so forth. That's a real thing. But someone took that very general fact, there aren't as many judges as we'd like to have right now, and turned that into there aren't any. Those are big leaps. Being short means, well, we're putting in some effort to try to identify good alternative judges to add to the system. Having none means we're in a complete panic and we have to do something, whether letting everyone out or assigning new judges willy-nilly. One way or another, you have to have judges if you're going to have a court procedure. This should go without saying, but people, given the panic and, and everything going on, were able to convince her I think she actually believed this from the way that she was repeating it, that there weren't any judges. Now, later in the process, there suddenly were judges. So I don't know if she caught on that there had been judges all along and they just weren't into the judicial system yet, or like, like because, because of their own option, not the, ju the judges were in the judicial system, that Allison's family wasn't. Um, but judges did, when a judge was needed, a judge magically appeared basically right away. So yeah, obviously there were judges. There's judges everywhere. I know judges, right? I go to parties with judges. They clearly exist. They're part of society. You see them out at the bar. They're out there. So they exist, right? Um, but because, again, people knew that they were easy to take advantage of. They weren't connected with their community. They didn't have a good feeling for the country. They didn't have real lawyers. So whoever it was was advising them from the lawyer standpoint was willing to say these things too, to take advantage of them. So you can see the layer after layer of everyone has identified throughout this process. I believe, I believe one person after another, as they go through this process, realizes that they have been living here with absolutely no knowledge of the country, absolutely no resources. And every person they turn to, they have to admit, we don't know anything about anything. We don't know anybody. We don't know anybody who knows anybody. We have nothing. And so they basically have to expose time and time again that they are 100% exposed with no knowledge and they're in a panic. And basically because of the people they end up talking to, each person is like, oh yeah, I'll take advantage of the situation and does, um, which is, Again, you're in San Juan del Sur. If you did this exact same thing in Leon, in Chinandega, in uh, uh, Matagalpa, in Hinotega, in Esteli, in Buaco, in Huigalpa, in Managua, I would not expect, even with all of the, uh, the, the lack of knowledge, all of the lack, I would expect that the ease of finding neighbors and lawyers who'd have been like, whoa, 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 someone's trying to take advantage of you. We can fix this right away. That would be obvious that you could trust them or trust them more or that the other people weren't trustworthy would have come forward. Uh, I think being in San Juan del Sur gave them so much isolation and, and so many people willing to build a cocoon of, of taking advantage of around them that it left them so incredibly exposed. That is my belief, but that is very much um, what the story sounds like. Now, another thing that I think needs to be pointed out that I don't know that Allison made this connection in the videos. At one point, she was pressured by a number of people to go to the Canadian embassy. She's Canadian and her husband's Canadian uh, and get them involved in this process. Now, if you step back and think of this from anywhere else, you're living in the United States and uh, you know, you're, you come from another country, you are involved in an accident. Nothing bad's happened to you. You're, you know, you're waiting for the police to determine who had the accident. You've asked for time to work something out. So you're not going to court yet. Nothing's gone wrong. You've not been charged with with anything. You're just, yeah, you have some medical issues and yeah, understandable. There's panic and all that. But instead of going to the court and doing the things you're supposed to do, getting a real lawyer, doing the things that are expected of you, instead you call your embassy and have them try to work out a deal to get you out of going through the legal system. That's not going to go over well in basically any country. That's not a really good process. That looks incredibly bad. Basically it looks very guilty uh, because you're not willing to even go into the legal system and find out what the issue is right now if you went through the legal system and um you know, determined that they were going to uh, keep you, that you didn't feel you were going to get a fair trial, that uh, there was some extenuating circumstances and and some leverage really needed to be applied. It, look, your embassy is there for certain circumstances, but it's not there for, ooh, I don't feel like going to court. Can you get me out of it? And I realize that for them, this was a major medical situation and there was a lot of panic and just, they felt very isolated, but these were not Nicaragua problems. These were not Canadian problems. These were just people who didn't put together their life ecosystem and now were paying the piper for that. And I don't mean to be harsh, 
But that's how people are going to look at it, right? That's how Nicaraguans are definitely looking at this. These people didn't have lawyers, but they were buying how they were doing all kinds of affluent things that Nicaraguans can't generally afford to do. The average Nicaraguan, the average middle class Nicaraguan can't go to San Juan del Sur and buy an enclave house in a gated community there with all expat neighbors. It's too expensive. And they, many of them can't afford cars. Many can, but many cannot, right? They're doing a lot of things that uh, that Nicaraguans can't do. And Nicaraguans can't just move to the U.S. and Canada. They don't have the right to do, they don't have visas to let them just do that. So there's already this, you know, very much you're in this very special, affluent, taking advantage of the situation kind of position. And then instead of going through the same hoops that a Nicaraguan would have to go through, suddenly you're calling the embassy and asking them to get you out of something. It's hard to imagine any person in Nicaragua looking at that and not being at least annoyed, if not furious, that you felt you could do that. Now, that's the first piece, but now realize it's the Canadian embassy. Nicaragua and Canada are currently not on friendly terms because Canada is not recognizing the political processes of Nicaragua on the behest of the United States, who is an open enemy of the Nicaraguan uh, state, right? The U.S. has occupied Nicaragua for 70 years over the last uh, uh, century and had colonized it in the 1800s. There's been an ongoing antagonistic relationship. There is essentially minimal, minimal uh, embassy relationship. Yes, there's still talk between them. Yes, there's still some amount of cooperation, but they are not friendly to each other in any way. Now, Canada's not as, as antagonistic with Nicaragua as the United States is, but these are specifically the country's least friendly with Nicaragua. So to have, and, the, the thing about it is that Nicaragua constantly feels that they are being pressured by giant foreign countries who try to take advantage of them and try to take their resources and try to control them through brute force and don't recognize Nicaraguan sovereignty. And that has been an ongoing thing that specifically the U.S. and Canada do not, from a Nicaraguan perspective, recognize sovereignty. They say on paper that they're a UN member and stuff like that, but they don't recognize Nicaragua's right to their own vote. They don't recognize that it has the right to not be occupied by foreign armies and so forth because the U.S. occupied with military force for a very long time and had a puppet government. These are very open things. The U.S. has admitted to this, right? We're not coming up with some secret here. This is standard history over the 20th century. So for Nicaragua to have someone from one of these countries have their embassy try to throw their weight around to buy past the legal system for someone, especially when there's no reason to, would be expected. There's no reasonable way to anticipate anything but a major negative response. The hope is that Nicaragua would ignore the request as just, yes, people do this because they get bad advice and, and just forgive them and ignore it. But there's every possibility that they would react very negatively. Now, from what we learned through a number of things, basically the official channels all ignored this. They it did nothing. The embassy had no power to even get a response, it seems, from Nicaragua, any, a meaningful response at least. However, at the time that they did this, as my guess, is that it became known to the police that this had been attempted. Now, the police have some discretion between treating you really well and treating you really badly. And the police had been treating them really well, maybe coincidentally, up until they pulled this embassy move. Once they pulled this embassy move, suddenly the police were no longer friendly with them and no longer assisting them. Originally, they were like, you know, trying to help her see her husband, helping them communicate, just doing things that the police have the discretion to do. And then suddenly they're like, no, we're not going to show up for that meeting. We're not going to do this at a convenient time for you. We're not in any way making this easy. Is it because of that move with the embassy? We don't know. But I can tell you, there's no way that contacting the embassy beyond being informational, right? You want to contact your embassy and say, look, don't do anything. Here's our status. This is going on. I'm sure everything's fine. Maybe things aren't fine, but don't do anything. But I want you advised just in case I do need to use you in the future. Here's the information. That's absolutely fine. And your embassy says to do that. Would I do that? I would not. But it's completely fine to do. My fear would be that the embassy would you know, take action against your will or something or use it in some negative way. 
be careful what you share with your embassy, right? They're not always 100% there to work for you. Sometimes they're super important and can help you. So I'm not saying that they're out to get you, but I'm just saying that they do have overriding concerns at times and you need to be aware that while they could be an asset for you under the right circumstances, they could be an asset against you and others. Don't just treat them blindly as part of your team. Um, and remember that often these are the same departments that ultimately are giving you incorrect advice about where to travel and giving you in misinformation about judicial systems and such and, and how to react and where to go. So you're already in a position where they've put you at risk in many situations to then go to them and be like, hey, can you help me with this risk problem? They're not a good resource for that in, in most cases. It's important to know that they're there. It's important not to forget them. Maybe you want to keep them in the loop. Absolutely. Engaging them to try to get involved here has no possibility of having been a smart move. That was reckless and ill-advised and every person involved should have been no what are you thinking do not do this and obviously the lawyer the person who claimed to be a lawyer who seems to have done absolutely nothing i uh, was the only one who did that but from the reaction of the police i am pretty confident that um that that was the trigger the timing the expectation the the just logical situation there seems to make that have been the case now importantly we cannot blame allison for this panic, medical conditions, bad legal advice, no knowledge of the country, no resources, right? They were in a bad position. These things happen. She got terrible advice. She questioned it. She got a lot of pressure from people who were not looking out for her interest, both in Nicaragua and in Canada. A lot of people in Canada were looking to take advantage of the situation politically. And that's something to be aware of that. And that will happen, right? Because this became exposed to people in Canada, Canadians, or Americans, a lot of people from any, you know, always be aware of international relationships. We're always looking for things that they can use in the news cycles. And if they jump on that, if you give them some fodder and, and it's easy to be manipulated like this was, like so many people. And it's amazing to me, right? People posting this, oh, this is why you can't trust judicial systems outside of, you know, the United States and Canada. And then you look at well, there was no judicial problem here whatsoever. And in the time between when this happened and when they posted that, there's been like two really major failures similar in the United States where it was a judicial system. One where they just let a, an inmate starve to death. One where a guy was just executed for a crime that everybody, including the prosecuting attorney, admitted didn't happen and that it was falsified. And they knew that the person who didn't pardon him was involved in like, holy cow, the failures of the judicial systems that they're saying are the ones you can trust that we know, you know, happened during this time. And this one, there was no judicial system and they still trying to leverage to try to make it look bad shows how much the people posting know how much better it is and how, how not risky this actually was and how much they had to manipulate her to get bad things to happen. By the end of the day, we're going to wrap up. We don't 100% know what happened anywhere. We can't prove who and what process actually got her husband out, but it looks like when a real lawyer stepped in, they were able to just work things out. We know that money was paid. We don't know if it went to the right people. We know that it was an absurdly large amount of money. They lost a ton of money on this, but that maybe that couldn't have been avoided given this what they had, right? We, in hindsight, could come up with ways to have avoided it, but only by taking action ahead of time. Uh, so. The takeaways here are, it's a tragic story and we feel terrible for what happened to Allison and it is not their fault. At no point is this their fault and we can't second guess or judge their behavior because they did nothing wrong um, and they simply made decisions in the moment that they had to make. They had a time crunch that we don't have. We have time to analyze. We have knowledge of things that happened later where we say, that was fishy. Oh, it turned out bad. It was really fishy. Of course, it sounds more fishy now. We know it was fishy, right? We can prove it after the fact. At the time, she didn't have those additional facts, so we can't tell how fishy it sounded or how, how unlikely it seemed to be true at the time. Now, it's clear. So we can't look at it through the eyes we have now, but we can look at it through a post-mortem eyes. So from a post-mortem perspective, what are our takeaways? As you, as someone who may be moving to a new country, any new country, but Nicaragua, definitely. One, start looking for a lawyer right away. It's part of just being part of a new country. Two, use lawyers 
and use the opportunity for evaluation for all the main things in life. Do not trust other people. Three, don't intentionally isolate yourself to, or accidentally isolate yourself to a point where you don't have fr uh, friend and family connections and an ecosystem to be able to help you, right? Become at least to some small degree a part of your community. Get to know people. Get out and get involved. That doesn't mean volunteering, but, you know, go to, go to musical events, go to concerts, go to, uh, social events, go to restaurants, get to know people in a way that is just more social. And I know some families just aren't social. Some people just aren't social. And that's super hard. And there's always going to be the hermit's risk, right? If you moved, if you live as a hermit in your home country, you're at risk. If you go to a new country where you don't have uh, the resources from having grown up there and you live as a hermit, you're at extreme risk. So always be aware of that. And if you want to do that, if that's just who you are and that's what you're going to be happiest doing, make sure you are getting really good legal resources so that even if you don't have those personal connections, you at least have official ones that you can call on uh, to provide that. And it's going to cost you a little bit more, right? But you got to have those people, right? But those simple steps, those really, really simple steps and, and be aware if you choose to live in an enclave, right? You're taking on additional risks. That doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do. It doesn't mean it's not right for you. It doesn't mean those risks are big, but they are risks that may not exist other places. And be super aware if Nicaragua is your choice, that San Juan del Sur is all of these things dramatically magnified in a way you're not gonna find in most places. Of course, you know, you can go to really famous places like Cancun or, uh, you know, Jaco in, in uh, Costa Rica, and you may run into similar scenarios, but none of them do I know of as being as famous as San Juan del Sur for this problem. So be aware. Nicaragua is insanely safe in general, and San Juan del Sur remains pretty safe, but not as safe as the rest of the country. But the place where your danger comes from is in being taken advantage of. This is not violent crime. This is not even petty crime. It is a white collar, often international crime. Many of the uh, ways that people get scammed is through international uh, deals, things that it's not easy for any one country to protect you against, very hard to hold someone accountable. And in this case, yes, there probably was ways to keep, make people accountable, but they were so confident in how well they knew, how not connected to the community that uh, Allison's family was, that they felt confident in really running roughshod over them. These are things that as humans, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm saying this is reality, is that humans are social creatures and we depend on our social connections for our safety. That is both protecting ourselves from the wolves, from volcanic eruptions, and from small independent actors who are not acting as a good part of the social group who are willing to pick off the easy prey, those who are left behind, those who are injured, those who are not part of the pack. Humans function best as a pack and so Think about that when you choose to isolate yourself. Yes, it may feel great to just be completely on your own and never deal with other people. People are stressful. People are mean. People are whatever. They wear you down. I get it, right? A lot of my family are introverts and it's hard to get them to go out and be social. Now, luckily we have family connections. I'm very social, so I do a lot of that for people and they get out and do it anyway. They just struggle to do it. But be aware that if you are all introverts and you all have no connections that you you are putting yourself at a risk and creating friends and family-like connections and and things are an important part to human survival and you'll notice that where did they turn they went back to canada which makes sense they needed it for medical treatment they needed family connections they had those family connections in canada they have i presume plenty of friends that they grew up with in canada and were able to go back and are back into a network of support most people when they move to a new country are going to find lots of people that are going to be in that community of support, but you have to make some effort to go find them. They're not going to necessarily come knocking on your door with an apple pie and say, Hey neighbor, we want to hang out. Um, just because they're there. Some people, you know, there's, there's just, it's a different world and you're not going to find that back in the U S and Canada anymore either. That was the 1950s, right? Now that's not how things work. You have to make an effort. Um, but, but most of us who moved to Nicaragua, we have so much, interesting going on that it's it's pretty easy to make connections but if you want to be isolated it's really easy to be isolated as well especially as there's so many people who are transient so many people who are snowbirding 
when you do that, um, it becomes natural to be like, I don't make a huge effort at getting to know everyone because there's a real chance I'll never see them again because I don't know which people are permanent and which ones are just passing through. So even having lived in an area for a really long time, yes, the Nicaraguans, I make a big effort to get to know, but the expats, if I don't know that they're permanent, I'm often like, oh, they're just a tourist, right? Like, that's cool. Like, if they want to talk, I'm happy to talk. But going out of my way to be like, oh, I need to make friends with this person. Oh, you're leaving next week? Oh, oh. Uh, I mean, that's, you're nice and all, but you know, that's, I'll never see you again. So anyway, if you have your questions, get down there in the comments, let me know. Um, but we, you know, uh, most importantly, um, I know that Allison has a GoFundMe. I know they've raised quite a bit, but they need a lot of help. Her medical condition is severe. Um, and they did lose, I don't think anywhere near as much as the GoFundMe, um, has, uh, has generated, but, um, they're working on getting um, back on their feet in Canada and, uh, you know, have an apartment. They lost their house in Nicaragua. They sold it. Um, and, uh, presumably without a lawyer, I'm guessing from the story, uh, so probably for, for much, they probably got much less than it actually sold for. Uh, but, um, they've, they've moved back to Canada and, uh, are working on rebuilding their lives. So if, if you feel compelled to definitely, uh, consider supporting them, they seem like really nice people with a really unfortunate set of circumstances that happened to them, but a sort of set of circumstances that I don't think our audience is going to have to worry about, but it's important to evaluate these things. Thanks for joining me. Like, and subscribe. If you'd like to help support this channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com. Uh, slash Scott Allen Miller. It'll be linked above. And uh, we have our new membership if you want to join with a month monthly subscription to really commit to supporting the channel. We really appreciate our members who are, this is just new for the last week. Uh, and we're getting, um, you know, a regular number of people. It's really amazing. Thank you for the support. And uh, I'll see all of you tomorrow.